Hi, this is Angel, the bartender. You know me. <laughs> Pastor Jay has asked me to invite you all to join us to get real here at the Ecclesia Cafe Piano Bar. And uh, here is Pastor Jay. Welcome to Get Real 2000 in the Ecclesia Cafe Piano Bar and uh, Bible Study. <laughs> We're going to do it in here today. We've got so much love that we've got to give in this life. And this is our life. But some of us think, maybe, maybe what I want isn't right. Maybe this isn't what God wants for me and for my life. That's why we have to be fully convinced, each one of us in our heart. And the only way we can get that is to just go to the Lord and study His Word. Why should we find fault and condemn people every day? It just seems like we want to do it every day. We just see the news is so bad <laughs> everywhere. But we're all a part of this world. And our teaching today says we've got to be fully convinced of what God Number wants 14 for us. is the teaching today. Fully convinced is the title. Finally, we read from John again. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not write now. So John is the only one that's writing about this. And this guy that we're going to read about, <laughs> he's got such a blessing here. Let's read about it in a New Living Translation in John 5, 1. It says, Afterwards, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holidays. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was a pool of Bethesda, with five covered porches, three. Cr crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches, verse 4. For an angel of the Lord came from time to time and stirred up the water. And the first person to step down in, into it afterwards was healed. Maybe not all Bibles have, verse 4. But anyway, the waters got stirred by God in some way. Verse 5, one of the men laying there had been sick for 38 years. 6, when Jesus saw him and knew how long he'd been ill, he asked him, wouldn't you like to get well? Verse 7, I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred up. Well, I am trying to get there. Someone always gets there ahead of me. Verse 8. Jesus told him, Stand up. Pick up your sleeping mat and walk. Verse 9. Instantly the man was healed. He rolled up the mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath day. 10. So the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. It's illegal to carry that sleeping mat. 11. He replied, The man who healed me said to me, Pick up your sleeping mat and walk. 12. So who said such a thing as that? They demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. 14. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, Now you are well stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you 15 then the man went to find the Jewish leaders and told them it was Jesus who had healed him now the pool of Bethsaida was a swimming pool with with five arches and a colonnade where people could be protected from the weather it is not explained why Jesus didn't just heal everyone that was there no doubt he didn't want to caused a big demonstration at this time when his enemies were plotting against him. Another reason might be to not cause too much of a distraction on, on the Sabbath. However, they all saw what happened to the paralytic and in doing so would be more receptive when that day came that the Holy Spirit would be sent to live in our hearts, in the hearts of all believers. You can just see that his words would go on. And here we're reading them in the Bible now. 
As we continue our ongoing study of the Gospels, we find Jesus had to deal with more traditions, rules, and regulations. To become fully convinced in our own hearts, we must consider what it means to us personally to be accountable to Jesus Christ. Let's go to NIV, John and chapter 5, verse 16. It says, so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. Doing something on the Sabbath, which was Saturday for the Jews, always brought persecution. God has been growing tired of this religiosity for a long time. Let's read what the Old Testament prophet Isaiah said. Turn to the New Living Translation, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 13. It says, this is God speaking through Isaiah. The incense you bring me is a stench in my nostrils. Your celebrations of the new moon and the Sabbath day and your special days for fasting, even your most pious meetings, are all sinful and false. I want nothing more to do with them. Verse 14. I hate all of your festivals and sacrifices, God said. I cannot stand the sight of them. Verse 15. From now on, when you lift up your hands in prayer, I will refuse to look. Even though you offer many prayers, I'll not listen, God said. For your hands are covered with the blood of your innocent victims. They were probably the needy, the naked, the oppressed, and the innocent victims now that are trying to find the Lord and find their way to Jesus. And there are even Christians out there that are causing a problem to keep them from finding Jesus, telling them that they could never be saved. Even today, God must hate church laws and rituals. <laughs> now, I'm going to get in trouble today. I just know it. I can feel it coming. He may hate all forms of religiosity that violate good, exalts, pride, and hypocrisy. This is why I have concern about Good Friday. Maybe celebrations when scripture doesn't support it. And Easter sunrise services that everybody just loves. It's a, just a time to get real now for me and to say what what I believe God's telling me to say. And so this teaching this today is really going to be this kind of a teaching. As I understand it, the word Easter was originally a Saxon word, oistre, E-O-S-T-R-E, -E, denoting a goddess of the Saxons, Easter, in whom sacrifices were offered. Is this a name that we should put on, on the day that Jesus was resurrected? This was taken, taken place about the time of the Jewish Passover. Somehow her name, Oyster, E-O-S-T-R-E, was given to the festival of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That together with the appearance of the worshiping the sun coming up at break of dawn, fertility images of Easter eggs and rabbits, etc. It just leaves me desiring to stay away from man's festivals, even though most groups insist on it to show inter-church unity. Are we being honest? However, the question remains, does coming together in the eyes of the world show a unity in Christ or an ongoing tradition of cover-up? Maybe in the eyes of the religious, it does serve a temporary emotional moment for man. But who are we fooling? I'm, I didn't come to, to knock Easter or Good Friday or anything, but I, today is the day that I just want to get real. Before God, is this any more honest than other mirages we have thrown up to hide what we fear and don't understand. It seems like when we go through the Bible and we're reading things that we don't understand, some good teacher will, will throw up something, a, a mirage or something that makes him understand it, and this is his commentary, and he wants us to believe it. 
the title man invented in the 1600s homosexuality okay here's the big one for today and I just pray that uh, that you'll have an open mind and let me say what's on my heart I can't lie I gotta say what I see and what I feel God is telling me a homosexual Christian pretending to be a heterosexual Christian for the eyes of the church family and world is a lie to our Creator Jesus Christ God sees our hearts, he knows the truth, and he must wonder why we continue to lie and condemn his children while doing a show of worship for him with blood on our hands. Will he listen to our prayers today? Sometimes I wonder today. Or does he hate our worship too? We continue in our chronological gospel teaching with John now in the New Living Translation, John chapter 5, verse 17. It says, but Jesus replied, my father never stops working, so why should I? 18. So the Jewish leaders tried all the more to kill him. <laughs> in addition to disobeying the Sabbath rules, he had spoken of God as his father, thereby making himself equal with God. Jesus was doing God's work. New Living Translation, Hebrews 1, verse 1. It says, Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. 2. But now, in these final days, he has spoken to us through his Son. In the NIV, Romans 14, verse 5, it says, One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. See, that's where we're getting the title for this teaching. Six, he who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord. For he gives thanks to God and he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. Each one of us must be fully convinced in our own mind who we are in Christ and believe the fact that Jesus took all, our, all record of charges against us and has nailed them to the cross. New Living Translation, Colossians 2, 14. It says, He canceled the record that contained the charges against us. Canceled it. He took it and destroyed it by nailing it to, the, to Christ's cross. 15. In this way, God disarmed the evil rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross of Christ. 16. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. 17. For these rules were only shadows of the real thing, Christ himself. And we should not let anyone condemn us for how God made us, who we are or what we look like or what we believe and desire. I'm going to go on to a commentary here again and I'm going to take this into the uh, computer so that maybe we can, uh, someone will send me a message or something and I'll be able to answer it because this, we're getting into something that is very controversial. So hang on, let's go into the, uh, into the computer room. So here we are, and now we're going to continue on where I left off in the other room. The commentary I'm about to uh, share will be controversial, to say the least. So please, bear with me in this. It's something that I just feel that I've got to say. But because of what God has been whispering in my ear, like we saw in the beginning of the uh, show today, I feel called to shout from the housetops this because nobody else will. 
And there's so much condemnation that's going on in this area that I just feel it's, it's the blood that we're talking about on our hands. Last time, we left off talking about those, those God would call sodomites, if you watched last time. Many theologians are now admitting that the sodomites were those who condemned strangers, caused oppression, did not help the needy, and basically did not love their neighbors as themselves, as Jesus had said were to do. And now we come to another example of the old and new wineskins in the church that we talked about last time, too. In this case, our new wine might be to unconditionally love those who would, like the eunuchs, be giving up marriage for the Lord, which Jesus and Paul encouraged. However, the old wine would remain steadfast to a traditional, unconditional argument bordering on believing if two of the same sex are not called to marriage, but are called to serve God together in a holy covenant, they are an abomination to God, even without what the NIV Bible calls homosexual abuse being considered. So you can see where I'm going and why this is uh, such a touchy subject. Remember, one must become a new creature to partake of the gospel. That's what we saw in the scripture last time. And the gospel never condemned or spoke against love in any form, but did suggest remaining unmarried. Although it is not found in the old or new reliable scriptures, Modern translators, as I said before, have added the word homosexual. Jesus never mentioned it, which puts God's children on a witch hunt for unmarried people who are not attracted to the opposite sex. Sometimes shames them into a marriage that God did not intend, just to satisfy others. So homophobia must be left in the old wineskin. Leave it back there. Old doctrine cannot exist with new discoveries in the Lord, any more than the law and the gospel could mix that we talked about last time. Well, the Jews could even accept Jesus as a Messiah when he finally came to save us all. They might be saying, yeah, I've enjoyed the show up until now, but now you're saying things that really cause my skin to crawl. Well, then maybe you're an old wineskin, and I don't want to offend you at all. But I feel that God wants me to talk about this. To accept the fact that there are multitudes in the world who must reject their choice to love and be loved by someone of the same sex, or be rejected by the church and family that they love, is to realize also that most of the beauty we have enjoyed in the world through generations was the result of a special gift from God of s sensitivity and an eye and ear for beauty or taste for God and everyone to enjoy, including all those who are too busy or <laughs> busy giving birth, raising children, and for those who are toiling in the fields to provide for their families. No, this concept of God's grace cannot be accepted by an old wineskin. I'm not saying you're old because you're an old wineskin, but it's the teaching of the, of, that we have always heard. And old wineskins would burst if they tried to accept it, if you want to study that up in the scriptures. So it must be new wine for a new wineskin so that God can be blessed and the angels can rejoice daily as more and more of his lost and persecuted sheep are finally flocking to ask Jesus to be the Lord of their lives. Are we going to stand in the, in the middle of that and stop people from finding the Lord? It's the Lord that guides their footsteps. Jesus gives freedom to all who come to him and believe which is more important than signs and wonders and healings, 
that we say that we you must be healed <laughs> or sacrificed. Many same gender partnerships have known Jesus from the beginning, but have been driven away by the devil's schemes, mostly by the very ones God entrusted them to. It's us. Not many Christians even know that by increasing numbers, same gender couples are dedicating their lives together in celibacy for Jesus. And a friend told me, Together in celibacy? No, it has to be a man and a woman in celibacy. I don't understand that because man and women were to have children. <laughs> so many people get married, but they don't want to have children, so they have any way that they can, t can go to keep from having children. And this by choice, not by church law or doctrine, they're dedicating themselves. Unmarried heterosexuals should consider the same. <laughs> yes, we're, we are all sinners. We are all capable of mistakes and the worst kind of behavior. We have personal responsibility to have a clear conscience before the Lord and be fully convinced in our own hearts and minds that our lives are lived for the Lord and with the Lord's guidance and counsel. We'll see you next time. Now I live. Promises and nothing seems worthwhile except to be in your kingdom of love, my Lord.